It's Sunday Showcase on the Mutual Audio Network. Tonight, the United Artists of Audio and all their peers pay tribute to two of our late, memorable brood of horror brewers, Mark Brzee of Darker Projects and Bill Hallwig of Broken Sea Audio Productions. We miss them. But if they are this ghastly night riding with us, perchance as apparitions, we truly hope they are listening and looking on in horror. Following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. You should experience lots of explosions with no body parts. Parents should be ready to cover their ears. And there, Janet, the concerto from the storm in that old abandoned theater. Oh, oh, Brad, it's so spooky. I'll protect you, Janet. Well, we can stay here for a while, until the storm passes. Look at these old posters. There hasn't been a show here in years. Good evening. Ah. What? what? Uh Uh-oh. I say, you you sure gave me a scare, mister. Indeed. Welcome to the Twilight Theater. The Twilight Theater? We figured this place was empty. Abandoned. And yet, we still like to put on a show for special guests. But we really don't want to... Let me show you to your seats. The show will begin shortly. Who are you? I am the Usher. Please be seated. The show is about to... Again. Tonight. They say that all life came from the oceans, but as the residents of Aberdeen, Massachusetts are about to discover when a mysterious and beautiful woman arrives in the New England fishing town, it's not just hearts that will be broken and some fish should be thrown back. Broken Sea Audio Productions presents The Strange Fate of Matthew Hornblower Written by Paul Mannering Produced and engineered by Bill Hoeweg Truth is often stranger than fiction. Mostly, that's because people can't accept the truth. It's just too much to put up on your wall and swear by. Which was why the truth of the burning down of Matt Hornblower's place never got discussed. Not by the newspapers or the folk of the town of Aberdeen, Massachusetts, and certainly not by those of us who were there that night. Matt's bar and grill had been a landmark of Aberdeen since Adam was a pup. Did a fair trade, too. 
travelers stopping by on their way up to Arkham, tourists in summer, and, of course, us regulars. Now, I remember when I was a kid, the place had sold fiction supplies. Before that, it was a printer's. The town's newspaper, the Aberdeen Mail, had been birthed on that site in 1842. <laughs> the night in question, it took the Clingham County Volunteer Fire Department most of the night to drench the fire. Those of us who ran out of the place before it became an inferno watched until it was all charred ashes. We had to be sure. It's not getting easier, Matthew. We gotta go out further, troll deeper, and the fishes are smarter. Yeah, they sure are, Gus. If the fish were stupid, they'd be New England fishermen. <laughs> <laughs> I should haul anchor and head south. Maybe run a trophy fishing charter out of one of those Florida ports. Maybe go to the Caribbean and find me a fat wife with skin as smooth and dark as chocolate. Gus, you're a melancholy drunk, that's for sure. But you got romance in your heart. Hey, Davey, it's not romance of his heart he's after, I think, but in his <laughs> pants, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Doc? Hey, you're awful quiet tonight. Can I get you a fresh coffee? Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, but I'll be fine. Eh, I was just thinking about this place. One of the oldest buildings in Aberdeen. The town newspaper was printed here, you know, back in 1842. Oh, yeah? And you were what? Start now practicing medicine back then. <laughs> <laughs> Mind yourself, young Davy. I delivered you, and I'm not so old that I can't stamp your ass return to sender and send you back. <laughs> Gee, Doc, you've been practicing medicine for so long, when you're gonna start doing it for real? <laughs> so, it's you I should be blaming for being born into this stinking town then, Doc. All this time, I thought it was my father's grave I should be spitting on. Actually, there is a resemblance. Hey, maybe you should be spitting on the dock instead of some stranger's <laughs> grave, Dave. <David. laughs> <laughs> Hey, Davy's mother, she was a fine-looking lady. Legs like Mae West, as I recall her. Narrow hips, though. Nothing to wrap your meat hooks around when you were riding the bedroom bronco, as old Cap'n Hesh used to say. Long legs, narrow waist, and you forgot about the rest of her when you saw the eyes. They were large, wide, and that gray-green color of a storm where it touches the ocean, and the sun is still striking the same waves, like jade and smoke. I was tempted, sorely tempted. I never felt she would have turned me down either. I would have pursued her, but for Davy Sr., I never knew a man more born and bred for sea work, like a draft horse born and bred for pulling. Old Navy, and he had salt in his veins, and he had a look of fish about him. He disappeared one trip, as so many had before him. They found Davy's boat, though, drifting empty, the nets and lines carefully stowed. There was no bad weather that night. We thought he might have been washed overboard by a freak wave. Even after the memorial service for Davy's dad, I still didn't succumb to the lure of his mother. Never did. And then she slipped over one bitter winter's night five years back, froze to death on her porch. She was so drunk she probably never felt the touch of the cold. Hey, hey, who's that? I don't know. She's been here since this afternoon. Hey, not drinking other than an iced tea. Guess she's waiting for someone. She's a looker, eh, hey, Gus? Aye, as fine as that mermaid I saw back in 79 off the shore. Hey, here we go. 
Man, if Gus will be telling his mermaid story, I'll have another coffee. Well, you can all snigger if you want. I knows what I saw and what I heard. Hey, what was that song she sang to you that night on your boat, Gus? You know what song it were. Go on, Gus. Tell us again. It were, show me the way to go home. Maybe she was lost, Gus. <laughs> <laughs> Gus, you saw something out there that night, but I suggest you don't try to tell that story to anyone who ain't your friend. As town doctor, I'm offering that as my professional advice. <laughs> Matt, looks like the lady's iced tea needs a refill. Excuse me, gentlemen, but I have a paying customer to attend to. Quit it, Davy. It's just a song, Gus. I thought you liked songs. Just quit it. Crazy. A fishing boat captain getting the willies over a hummed tune. Got it out, Davy. You know Gus isn't fond of sharks. Yeah, big baby. Davy, shut it. Hey, hey, check it out. Looks like she was looking for more than iced tea. Yeah. Well, go, Matthew. He's actually sitting down at her table. She's a pretty lady. Twenty bucks says he lands her tonight. You got a tiny mind, Davy. That's not like that. He's, he's got respect for women. I'll put up twenty. Doc, you hold the money. Sure. You lot will only drink it away otherwise. If he doesn't land her, I'm gonna have a go. The question of whether or not Matt landed the beautiful lady at the bar was moot. Within a week, it was the hottest gossip in the village. Matthew Hornblower had a lady in his life. I'm sure there were a few hearts that crackled at the news. I would have thought Matt would be on top of the world. He'd had his share of ladies, I'm sure. But this one was here in the off-season, and she seemed ready to stay. The next night, she was at Matt's bar and grill again, and the third. We got used to seeing her there. She wouldn't say not to any other, only had eyes for Matt. As it went on, he only had eyes for her, too. (laughs) He started looking a bit vacant to start with, a bit pale, like he was coming down with something. She had hair as long and pale as this beer. It flowed out around her like silk, and she just floated there, singing up to me as I stood on the aft deck. And you didn't invite her aboard for a roll in your bunk. I just listened. Must have been an hour she sang. Only remember the one song, though. Show me the way to go home. We know, Gus. You tell this story every damn night. It's the only story I got, Davy, And it's the one that won't leave me. Looks like Matt's got the one that won't leave either. Yeah, what's up with that? Every night she's here, sitting, drinking iced tea, and Matt's just making goo-goo eyes at her. You still pissed you didn't win the bet. Uh, I think he's lying. How can you have a girl like that and not gaff her? Well, uh, maybe Matt and this lady. Uh, what is her name, anyhow? I heard Matt call her Liddy. Sounds kind of foreign. Well, Matt and Liddy may actually have real feelings for each other. Maybe they just want to take time and get together when it feels right. Jesus, Doc. When does it not feel right? Matt! Matt! Hey, Matt! We're dry down this end. You want us to run aground? Yeah, sorry, fellas. Matthew, are you okay? You look a little pale. Ah, fine, Doc. Just been busy as all. Not busy enough, I'd say. Uh, she's not like that, Davy. You don't know her. Well, that's just it, Matt. None of us do. Uh, how about you introduce us? <laughs> yeah, I will, sure. Now nah, it's not a good time, though. Okay, guys? Excuse me, fellas. I got orders to take. She's just damn fine to look at. What a terrible waste. She's pretty, that's for sure. Matt's a lucky guy. That mermaid I saw had hair about that long. No, Matt's girl's hair is darker. Ah, oh, Christ. I can't stand it. See you later. I'm going shark fishing. I'll bring you back a big one, Gus. Bring it back alive. 
You can keep it in your bathtub. <laughs> 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 was the only gas station in town. He sold everything from the gas we put on our cars and trucks to the marine gas that kept the only industry we had going. Tony Tino should have been a billionaire, except he was only leasing the station and the pumps from one of those big oil companies. They took the money and they left him with the bid he made selling tobacco and gum out of the convenience store side of things. I pulled in there about a week later. Matt was standing on the forecourt. Trying to put a two-gallon tank of gas on the back of his truck. Hey, Matt, you need a hand with that? Doc, yeah, hey, <laughs> sure. Heavier than it looks. Matt, a week ago, you were heaving kegs around one-handed. Now you're troubled by a can of gas? You should come down to my office this afternoon. I think we need to run some tests. You look like shit. Is that your professional opinion, Doc? No, Matt. That's my opinion as your friend. My professional opinion is the same, but I tend to use different words to make me sound more like a doctor with 40 years' experience. Yes, yeah, sh- sure, sure. I'll come down this afternoon. Well, you see that you do. Matt, uh, you've been in contact with something poisonous? There's skin on your arm. It's uh, not supposed to be flaking like that. Let me have a look, huh? You feel clammy, Matt. You've been vomiting, feel faint, lost appetite? It's nothing, Doc. I'll be fine. I, I gotta go. Will you be sure you come by my office this afternoon, Matt? I want to give you a full checkup. Sure. Yeah, well, hey, whatever you want, okay? Yeah, thanks. I saw Matthew Hornblower alive. He never showed up at my office that afternoon. After closing, I headed straight down to the bar. The place was closed up. No sign of life except for the concerned citizens out front. You in there, buddy? We're dying of thirst out here, buddy. You gonna open up or what? I can't see anyone. The bar's empty, Davey. Evening, boys. What's the problem? Bar ain't open. Matt's not there. We've been banging on the door for now to an hour. Did you try opening it? Uh, it didn't seem right, Doc. Like breaking in. You're here now, Doc. We can go in if you're here, right? Sure. I'll tell the sheriff it was a medical emergency. Emergency? You think Matt's hurt? Let's just do the neighborly thing and get in there and see if Matt's home. Doors open. After you, Doc.
Matt, you home? This place is weird when it's not a bar. You're weird, Gus. When is Matt's not a bar? You know, when it's not open and when the chairs are all up on the tables and the juke ain't playing and... <laughs> Matt, that you? It's Doc Baker, Gus, and Davy. Where are you, son? What's that smell? You? Uh-uh. I had a bath this week, but it smells like fish going bad. Real bad. Damn. Matt? Maybe Matt's freezer broke down. Matt? I think that came from upstairs. We better take a look. Matt? I never seen Matt's apartment. It's weird. Why is everything wet? That's seawater, like the flood in the Bible. This place is trash. And what's this crap smeared on everything? Looks like some kind of clear mucus. Matt? M Matt? Doc, sounds coming from behind this door. Good. Matt? You step back, Davy. Gus, put one of your size 12s to the door. Huh? Kick the door open, Gus. Okay. What is that? That tank? To this day, I have no answer to that. It was about as human-shaped as a gingerbread man. A translucent form, like a jellyfish. I could see right through it, into the open wound on Matt's chest, where this thing was sucking the life and blood from him. Doc, do something. Get it off him. Jesus, it's Doc, eating him. Doc, my love came home from the sea. Oh. Doc, my love came home oh. from the sea. Out of I think we all bolted right then. Maybe Davy led the charge, but we all just had to get away. Away from Matt's dead gray eyes and the terrible taunting sound of that old tool. Gus, huh? Hill, give me a hand. I, I turned my ankle. Davy outside, lay him down. Okay. But well away from here. Oh. What was that thing, Doc? What was it doing to Mac? Easy, big fella. I got no idea, Gus, but I don't think God made it. Sort of thing God would have dreamed up in his own nightmares. Davy had tripped on the gas tank that Matt had been struggling with that very morning. It was standing at the bottom of the stairs. Maybe Matt had realized that this woman he had given his heart to was some kind of abomination from the sea. I got the cap off and set to splashing the gasoline around the place. Burn it all. Burn it. Gotta burn it. Gotta burn it all. Gus. Doc, get Gotta out of there. It. I got my flare gun. Gotta Doc. burn it all, Gus. <laughs> Doc. <laughs> I'm okay, Gus. I gotta get well back. The place is gonna burn hotter than the fires of hell. What are we gonna say, Doc? What are we gonna say when people ask us what happened here? I don't rightly know, Gus. I'd say we don't tell them the truth. Folks aren't gonna likely take well to that. She, she came from the sea, like your damn mermaid, Gus. She came from the sea and she took Matt, like some damn sucker fish. <laughs> Took time out to read a pointed message 
Whoever fights monsters should see to it that in the process he does not become a monster. And if you gaze long enough into an abyss, the abyss will gaze back into you. The sheriff and the Clingham County Volunteer Fire Department got there as quick as they could. Even after the ashes was cold, they never found any sign of the second body. Gus quit fishing, sold his boat, and left town. Davy never signed on with another boat after Gus left. He uh, took up drinking full-time instead and never left his house. And didn't take well to visitors after that. As for me, well, I retired. Moved in all the way across the country and into the mountains of Colorado. Somewhere I can't hear the ocean at night. Do keep this in mind, dear listeners, as we join Jake Sampson. Lucy Carter, and Texas Oldham on their trek to find Robert E. Howard's simian nemesis as the CBS Radio Mystery Theater again returns us to Jake Sampson, Monster Hunter, and the dramatic conclusion to The Hyborian Gate. Thank you for listening to The Strange Fate of Matthew Hornblower this evening. The script was written by Paul Mannering and mixed by Bill Holweg. Starring in tonight's dark tale were Joe Stofko as Doc Baker, Gus was Matt Weller, Davey, Bruce Busby, Matt Hornblower, Jeff Billard, and Draven Schoberg as The Mermaid and playing on Doc's car radio, Dark Fantasy, The Thing from the Sea, and Jake Sampson on the radio, taken from the Hyborian Gate, episode number five, A Broken Sea. Paolo was playing in Matt's bar, while also playing on Doc's car radio, the CBS Radio Mystery Theatre Revision, E.G. Marshall, played by his evil twin with bells, Music by Kentiga. Music from CBS Radio Mystery Theatre and Peter Wicks of Westlake Films. Thank you again for listening. This has been a Broken Sea Audio Production. <laughs> this is Jack Ward, and on behalf of everyone here, at the Mutual Audio Network, we wish you, your family, and all your friends safe harbor during these difficult times.